and welcome to High School Physics Explained and today I want to talk about positron emission tomography. And positron emission tomography is a type of scanning technique that uses a radiopharmaceutical or a radioactive chemical that we utilize in the body that will allow us to perform scans and understand the inside of the body. So ultimately positron uh, is the term we use for the production of a small uh, subatomic particle uh, which is produced inside the body uh, in a particular uh, nuclear reaction. Emission, in the fact that the positron is actually emitted and interacts with our body, which I'll explain in a moment. And tomography, that the information we get is fed into a computer and allows us to produce slices. And that is what tomography means, to produce images that are slices. So let's see how this positron actually is utilized in terms of imaging. Before we go on, we need to first of all understand the source of this positron. And the source of the positron is a radiopharmaceutical, in this case, and the one I'm going to be concentrating on, is FDG. Now, I could use other examples of chemicals that involve radioactive isotopes of C11, nitrogen-13, and oxygen-15, but today I'm going to particularly concentrate on the most familiar form of radiopharmaceutical involved the PET, and that is FDG, which stands for fluorodeoxyglucose. And in essence, it is a glucose analog. And if you look very carefully here at this model of the glucose molecule, it is actually a glucose, with the only exception being is that an oxygen atom has been removed and replaced with a radioactive isotope of fluorine, fluorine 18. So what's really important here is that FDG, and I'll use FDG from now on to save me getting tongue-tied, is that FDG behaves chemically in every way the same as glucose does. So wherever glucose is utilized in your body, and you know that glucose is a very important chemical in the chemical reactions of respiration, that is the important chemical reaction in every cell of your body to produce energy, then wherever glucose works, so will FDG. The only difference is, is that while FDG is actually being utilized in your cells, it is also radioactive, and so therefore it releases some sort of subatomic particle as it decays. And so we're going to explore how that actually is useful for imaging. So let's concentrate first and foremost on specifically the fluorine. So here's fluorine. And fluorine itself, fluorine 18, has a mass number of 18 and it has nine protons. And if you can work that out, it has not only nine protons, but nine neutrons. Now fluorine itself in this form is radioactive. And so it is radioactive in such a way that it decays into oxygen. Now, how does it decay into oxygen? Well, if you can see by the numbers, clearly my number of protons has decreased, and yet my mass number has stayed the same. So that means the only possible explanation for what's going on here is that a proton has converted into a neutron. We won't go into the specifics of the nuclear physics involved here and how a proton can be converting into a neutron, but it is then clear that we have somehow lost a positive one, a charge of some sort. And what we just use is that here, a release of a positron. And a positron is in every respect similar to an electron, except that it's positively charged. But it also is fundamentally different to all other forms of matter. A positron is actually antimatter. And despite what you might think in terms of alternate universes and so forth, antimatter is a type of matter that is that cannot coexist with normal matter. And as we'll see in a second, that is really important. But the most important thing is to understand is that we have a fundamental particle, some, some sort of subatomic particle that is in many respects very similar to an electron, but is positively charged and is a form of antimatter. But most importantly, as you can see, what it leaves behind after the positron decay, the fluorine now becomes oxygen. And oxygen 18 in this case is another stable form of oxygen. So if we were to go back to our FDG, 
it's now actually converted into glucose proper. There's no longer a fluorine atom there, it now has an oxygen atom, and therefore it's still glucose. So what happens to this positron? So here is my FDG, and as I said to you, this fluorine will decay into oxygen and therefore converting this back to ordinary glucose. So it releases this positron, and that's how we write down the symbol positron. We write it as an E because it in many ways is fundamentally like an electron, except it's positively charged. But it won't travel very far. As I said to you, the positron cannot coexist with matter. And so very shortly, it will come across an electron. Now this electron could be a free electron, but more than likely, it'll be an electron that is involved with another chemical close by. So what happens when these two come together? Well, the most important thing to understand here is they annihilate. That is, they completely destroy each other. And that the mass that the, both the positron and the electron actually have completely disappears and is ultimately converted into energy. And that energy is, of course, calculated by E equals mc squared. So here we have a classic example of an application of Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared. A positron and an electron annihilate and as a result produce energy. But what's special about this energy is that it produces two photons of gamma radiation. And what's really important too is that these two photons actually travel at 180 degrees to each other. And that's really significant as we'll explore shortly. So what is happening? So here's an example of a brain and brain is where a lot of this happens because a brain utilizes a lot of glucose. That's why I've got a picture of a brain here. We've got the FGG, it's a misrested. Then clearly the FDG accumulates where there is glucose metabolized. We have positron emission. The positron annihilates with an electron to produce energy and produces two gamma photons, which are released at 180 degrees. Some of you may be asking why 180 degrees, and that is again explained by another important law, that is, that is the law of conservation of energy. So, now that we've got two gamma photons being released, what actually happens next? So here, I have a very simple diagram to represent what happens when a person gets a scan. And over here, I have a ring of detectors. Now these are gamma detectors. Then over here, I've got a body. And in this section here, I have representative of something that releases positrons. In other words, this is where there is a high rate of glucose uptake. And so this is the area that is going to be releasing in gamma radiation. And so how does this ring of detectors know that this is the place of the gamma bursts? Well, the first thing you need to understand, of course, is I have two bursts of gamma radiation going in opposite directions. And what's really important to understand is, is that this detection of the gamma burst and this gamma burst is for all intents and purposes arriving at the same time. In other words, this and this are simultaneous events. And the computer can detect that these two are opposite to each other and therefore also that these two bursts arrive at the same time. However, what is important also to understand is that this particular gamma burst has traveled through more tissue. And this gamma burst has traveled through less tissue. And so therefore the amount of attenuation or the amount of energy loss of this gamma burst over here is going to be a little bit more on this side than this side. And so with some complex mathematics and connected of course to a computer is that these sensors can determine the actual place of the gamma burst by working out the difference between the intensities of these two gamma bursts. Now, Clearly, this is not enough. And of course, there is going to be multiple gamma bursts 
in all different directions. And in fact, in order to produce an image, this calculation, this determination has to be done up to a million times for the actual computer to determine the actual place of this uh, FDG uptake and hence the positron emission. But that in essence is what happens. So now all of this information of course is fed into a computer, analyzed to produce an image. So here is an image of PET scan. Let's have a close look though at the features of it. The first thing you should notice is at least in terms of structure, we have low resolution. So a doctor's not going to provide you at a PET scan simply because he wants to get a good structural feature of your body. Clearly PET scan is not useful for that. So why does he take it? Well, let's have a look at the image and you'll see that there's areas that are really dark up here and a bit diffuse over here. And what's really important to understand is that PET scans are really high in function. What do I mean by that? Well, clearly there is more metabolic uptake of FDG in the brain than anywhere else in the body. Now, clearly there's obviously uh, FDG or glucose metabolism occurring in lots of part of the body, but far more is occurring in the brain, which is what you would expect. So it appears darker. So in other words, PET scan gives you not information about structure, but about functional activity. Now, in this case, we have a elderly woman who's had a, a PET scan and the doctors noted the fact that there are areas that are darker, such as here and here and here, which is higher in terms of what normally would occur in a patient. So in this case, we have a case where a woman has signs of colon cancer and colon cancer is a ultimately uh, your own cells rapidly dividing and rapidly mutating and obviously they need glucose so there is a lot more glucose uptake than there would be normally and so the patient is showing signs of cancer simply by the darkness here now of course the bladder as well has a dark area that isn't necessarily meaning that they've got cancer but of uh, the glucose is broken down and your kidneys will ultimately take those waste products into the urine and so therefore there's a good chance that some of the FDG actually ends up in the urine or at least the byproducts thereof and so therefore you're going to get some sort of uh, image in terms of the bladder. But if you look down over here this is the same patient but here we've got another slice and you can see here this slice is pretty much straight down the center and this slice is a little bit back you can't see the head over here but clearly the doctor also notices there is a little bit more uptake of FDG in the lungs uh, that's suggestive of some sort of tumor so let's summarize very quickly well FDG ultimately is a an example of a radio pharma school used in positron emission tomography. Positrons are emitted as the FTG decays into normal glucose. That positron is then annihilated as it encounters an electron, releasing two gamma photons in opposite directions due to the conservation of energy. And they are in turn detected by a ring of gamma collimators or a gamma camera, which then can determine the actual position of those bursts to produce an image. I hope that has helped you understand PET. Thanks for listening. Bye for now. I hope you found that video useful. And remember, like, share and subscribe. Oh, and if you have a comment or a question, or you'd like a concept for me to explain to you, please drop a comment down below. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.